Come on, call. Boom. What's up guys, Alex back in action. I'm excited today. Get a quick session in in the afternoon. It is a Wednesday and I got to finish up what I was working on this morning and just felt like today was the right day. I've been kind of patient with not pushing this wind too much because the last thing I want to do is when there's a lot of momentum and I'm doing really well in poker, I don't want to force the action just for the sake of playing. I don't want to just play because I've been winning and when I'm not really feeling it, when I'm not really listening to myself and what I know I should be doing, and then just force myself to play because, oh, I'm winning, I should play, and then I lose. And then I start this the, the virtuous cycle, which is you're playing well, you're running well, you're making good decisions, you're doing everything right, turns into the vicious cycle, which is you make a bad decision, then you start losing, and then maybe you take a bad beat or two, and then it sticks to you, and then you start the vicious cycle. So I'm really cognizant when I'm winning of just being super patient. It's something I've learned over time. And I feel like today's a good day to play. I'm not gonna push it too much. I got my game plan going. Basically, at this point, I'm just, it's not broken, I ain't gonna fix it. If you watch the past couple vlogs, you'll know that I've been doing really well. I've been focusing on a solid foundational game theory approach. It's been serving me well. And then I've been making slight adjustments when I get to the point where I can make notes on people. So I get to the point where I've played enough hands with one player at a table where I could start to make a note or two, and those notes are the cues for the adjustments I'm gonna make. So today, more of the same. I'm gonna hop in the biggest game. Really excited to see what it has in store, and let's dive in. There's nothing as beautiful as him tanking on the river. You know you have the best hand, and he finally goes. Hey guys, thanks for your attention. If you're still here, do me a favor and hit that like button. Also, you might want to subscribe to our channel because we produce awesome content here. A lot of vlogs like these, plus a hand of the day where I review key hands and an Ask Alex show where I take your questions and answer them in future videos. So be sure to hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications because more awesome content is coming at Conscious Poker. All right, this first hand kicks off where we're four-handed playing 10-20. The villain opens in the cutoff to 50. I defended the big blind with 8-7 offsuit. And the flop comes 987 with two diamonds. Check, check. Turn comes to 10, bringing another diamond. I check again, he checks. And the river comes to six. So now there's a straight on the board, but there's three diamonds. And in a spot like this, I wanted to share this hand with you because it's a spot where I can have a lot of strong hands and the villain can't. The villain would never uh, check the turn with a straight or a flush. So his range is what is called capped, meaning the strongest hands he can have is basically limited to the board. He's almost always playing the board in this spot, given the way he played the hand on a previous street. So the process I use to figure this out is called a hand range funnel. And the idea behind it is that your opponent's range starts very, very wide. So there's a lot of hands that they could have pre-flop and then on the flop, but as they take more and more action, you can narrow down the types of hands they can have using the image of a funnel. So you imagine funnels start very wide, they get narrower, and that's the process I use to identify what my opponents are holding. So um, if you'd like more from that, you could download it for free at the link below, uh, or just head over to ConsciousPoker.com, enter your email anywhere, and I'll send it to you for free. It's the exact methodology I use to hand read. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of what I'm doing in all these types of hands, is figuring out exactly what my opponents are holding based on the action they take. So at this point, I'm playing the board but I have a diamond in my hand and I know my opponent is playing the board. So I decided to bet 300 into a pot of 100 because I know that he really can't call me. It looks like I have a jack, it looks like I have a flush, maybe I have queen jack, and he's never really gonna call playing the board. So I utilized a big bet sizing here because I'm applying maximum pressure when I could have a very strong hand and he frankly can't, forcing him to fold. He ends up folding, I win myself a nice pot, but it's small pots like these where you're really gonna gain an edge because as you're moving up in limits, as you're playing bigger stakes against better competition, it becomes a game of inches. 
So this was a key hand, and uh, or interesting hand at least, because these spots happen over and over and over again. And if you're finding edges in these spots, that's gonna compound for you and add up over the long term. This next hand comes with a short stack on the button. We're playing three-handed. Uh, he opens to $44. I make it 170 in the small blind with king nine of hearts. I'm not gonna be three betting here too often, but it really puts him in a tough spot because it's hard for him to call a three bet. He's kind of forced into a situation, a bind, where he has to either jam or fold. So three betting becomes more advantageous for me. He ends up calling and we take a flop, which comes 10-5-5 five, five with two hearts. I flop a flush draw, great flop for me, I have the lead. But given the stack sizes in this spot, I decided to check and I wanted to make my hand look weaker than it actually was, inducing him to bet. My hope was that he would bet the flop with all of his air and then I could check raise all in. If I get called, I still have an overcard, I have a flush draw, and I could win an extra bet by him by checking instead of just betting. So I check, he checks behind, which is fine. The turn comes to seven of spades, uh, blank. And now I decide to bet, and I go for a big size here. I decide to bet 220 because I really want him to fold a hand like ace high. I have king high, I don't want him to just call. So if I bet really small here, like a third of the pot, he might call down with ace high, and then on the river I don't really know what to do. So I decided to bet bigger here to force him to fold those types of hands. He calls, and at this point I'm not loving my hand. Uh, because I don't think he would call with ace high, so I think he probably has a seven, maybe he has pocket eights, maybe he checked a 10 on the flop. Uh, the river comes a, a blank heart, which obviously is great for me. I have a pot size bet left, so I decide to jam. And I think that's really the only play here. I don't really see a reason to bet small. I really like a jam here. It kind of looks more bluffy because he's never gonna put me on hearts because I checked the flop. And he's really only thinking I either have an overpair, which check the flop and then now bet the turn and bet the river, or I'm bluffing. So I think it looks fishy, it looks like a bluff, and I think I'm going to get hero called here quite a bit. So I decided to jam, and he ends up tank calling with a 10. Great spot for me, and win a nice pot. This next hand was pretty interesting because it's a three-way pot, and you don't get these often. I know a lot of you have questions about playing in multi-way pots. So under the gun plus one min raises. He's a short stack. He makes it. He makes a min raise. The button calls, and I defended the big blind with nine five of diamonds. The flop comes eight six four rainbow. Everybody checks. Turn comes a king. I decide to bet out eighty here and I think it's a good spot for me. Although one of the players could have a king, no doubt. I'm in the big blind, so I could easily have a big blind splash hole, which connected with this board. So it really puts them in a pretty tough spot. If they have a king, they're gonna call. If not, I'm just gonna win this pot right away. So I bet, and now both players call, which is really weird. So I'm putting at least one player on a king here. Um, my plan is pretty much to give up. The river comes at ace, which is a great card because it's pretty unlikely, almost impossible for them to have an ace given how they played the hand. How could they call the turn on a king 864 board with an ace. Very unlikely, right? So at this point, uh, I still have the advantage. I can still have a big blind special. I could have 86, I could have 75, I could have sixes, eights, fours, I could have king eight, I could have king six, or I could have been bluffing the turn with something like ace seven or ace five and now rivered an ace. So there are a lot of hands that I can have which are strong and there's it's very unlikely that my opponents have any of these types of strong hands because they check the flop. So again, using that hand range funnel we talked about in the first hand, just narrowing down the types of hands they have based on how they played previous streets, really unlikely they check the monster on the flop and really unlikely they called the turn with an ace. So it's likely that both players have at best a king and they're not really gonna be hero calling me betting into two players because one of the players is sandwiched so he has the button behind him and then the button is not going to think that I'm bluffing into two players. And frankly, he's sitting there with a king on the river. What, what's he going to do? Call and hope I have 9-5? I mean, it's just not that likely. So I go ahead and bet 300. A big size bet here. I really want to apply a lot of pressure and force them to, in, into a tough spot. Both players full. I win a nice pot. Now, finally, the spot I've been waiting for. I'm up about 1,400 in this in this session, and I'm about to quit the game. My battery's running low, and I'm just, you know, it's, it's nearing 5 o'clock. I'm about to head home, and I get the following hand against the VIP, who I've really been waiting for. Uh, one hand, he opened under the gun. I three-bet in second position, and he just four-bet jammed on me. He just literally shipped it for 2,000. So I know he's a VIP. He's clearly just kind of a punter. I've been seeing him play quite a few spots, just way too aggressive, not very good. So he opens under the gun. I three bet to his left again with ace jack offsuit uh, with a jack of hearts and he calls. Great spot for me. Fine. Loving it. Flop comes king, queen, 10 with two hearts. So I flop the joint. <laughs> it's like, man, how often does that happen? Uh, he checks. 
I bet 325. I just want to make a big bet. And, you know, if he has a king or he has any part of this board, he's going to call. I could bet big on the turn or jam the turn. We're going to get all the money in here, right? So now he just ships it on me. So I'm like, okay, I call. I got the nuts, right? Please hold one time. Uh, so the turn comes. So he has eight, seven of hearts, right? Just a cold flush draw. So not only does, you know, he has only a flush draw, but I have a jack of hearts in my hand, blocking plus a redraw. Turn comes a four hearts, so I'm like, oh my gosh, really, are you serious? Uh, please, hit a heart, right? And then, of course, the river blanks. So I lose a 4K pot, which is pretty brutal. Um, and that's kind of like the last significant hand I played in the session. So unfortunately, um, it went that way. Let's wrap this up. Thanks for your attention. Just on the way home, we were probably wondering about totals. So for this session, I lost 26.41 in two hours, 15, two hours, 20 minutes. Um, it is what it is. Can't win them all. <laughs> Definitely buzzkill for our crushing hourly rate in the past, but we'll get it back next time. Thanks for everybody's attention. Appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Subscribe and like, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.